you can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. one from Cameroon here dear pastor what does the Bible mean by saying if your hand causes you to sin cut it off and if your eye causes you to sin cut it off it is better to enter into the kingdom of heaven with one hand than to go to hell with your full body yeah I want you to understand the teachings of Jesus and many times Jesus Jesus brought our knowledge to his listeners in a way that they could understand exactly what he was saying he wanted them to be able to ask certain questions and answer those questions from their own uh, from their own reasoning about themselves so sometimes he spoke in parables many times he spoke in parables but this is not a parable what Jesus is saying here is very simple I want you to listen to it because it was stated several times from what you what you wrote here is actually what you have in the Bible he says if your hand causes you to sin cut it off in another portion it says if your hand offends offends you which means the same thing causes you to sin cut it off and if your eye causes you to sin the question you should ask is can your hand cause you to sin can your eye cause you to sin Jesus said something one time the the Jews came to him and they said uh, Rabbi we, we see that your your disciples are doing that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day and then they questioned him why do your disciples eat without washing their hands so they wanted answers from Jesus and so Jesus taught something that was very important he said it's not that which enters into you that defies you is that which comes out of you and when he when he said that even the disciples had difficulty getting it so they came to him later in the house and they said master what did you mean what you said to those Jews they were offended and then Jesus said don't you understand it's not that which goes into you that defies you it's what comes out of you See, because what comes out of you comes from your heart and that's the point so how can you say your hand cost you to sin so Jesus says if it's your hand that cost you to sin cut it off if it's your eye that cost you to sin cut it out so question where is your sin where is your sin Jesus always wanted to point them to their hearts he always wanted them to know 
where the problem was. The problem was not in the hand that they caught, you know, because the law said if they caught somebody here and here was what they should do. Stone him to death, cut out this, cut out that. So, uh, tooth for tat. Why did that man offend you? He hit you. Okay. If he cut your hand off, you cut his hand off. All of these kind of things. Now, Jesus says the real sin is in the heart. The real sin is in the heart. So if you were going to cut off your hand, you say, if my hand caused me to sin, question is, how did your hand cause you to sin? Does your hand have a mind of its own? Can your hand act on its own? Can your hand steal on its own? Can your eyes lost on their own? He's pointing you to something. He's pointing you to something. He's pointing you to your heart. That's what Jesus is doing. Pointing you to your heart. So you understand that. That's why he said it's better to go into life or to go into the kingdom, the kingdom of God with one hand than to go to hell with two hands. So why don't you cut it? And it'll be the Jew's mind to say, but master, my hand didn't make me do it. My hand was an agent. And they said, that's it. Oh, my eyes didn't make me do it. My eyes were an agent. Oh, that's it. So your eyes don't lost. Your hands don't steal. He said, out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts and thefts and blasphemies and so on and so forth. It's from the heart. So it's the heart that needs a change. And that's what he was getting at. That you need another heart. And that's what the prophet said. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I'll take the stony heart out of your flesh and give you an out of flesh. You need another heart. That's what Jesus is saying. You've got to have it cut out and he'll give you a new heart. All right. Um, Jonathan from Nigeria. Dear Pastor, why is the name of Jesus so powerful? Can an unbeliever use the name of Jesus? Why is the name of Jesus so powerful? What a question. Honestly, I, I, I think it's a good question. Why? Because we talk about use the name of Jesus, pray in the name of Jesus. Why is the name of Jesus so powerful? Pastor Obi, you want to say something? Because God highly exalted him. God and highly gave exalted him. Gave him a him. name that is above every name. Gave him a name yes, that is above every name. Yes, sir. That means he vested all authority in that name. Yes, sir. Why is the name of Jesus so powerful? What a question. I, I want to have this, Pastor, yes. because um, that's the only name mm -hmm. by which any man can be saved. Yeah. There is no any other name you can call upon to be saved except the name of Jesus. Mm. And um, it's because of the power in that name. Mm. Because he went to the cross and died for us. And like Pastor Obi said, he's been given a name that's mm. above every other name. So for you to be saved, you need that name mm. of Jesus to be saved. I want to tell you why the name of Jesus is so powerful. You see, the name of Jesus <laughs> is not the spelling of the name. It's not J-E-S-U-S. -S. The name of Jesus is not how it sounds. It's, it's, it's not the pronunciation. You see. Because even around the world, we don't pronounce the name the same way. The name of Jesus is the name of a person. The reason the name of Jesus is powerful is because it is the name of the person that has the power. You get it? That's why it's so powerful. The man that owns that name was given all authority in heaven and in earth. The Bible says that God gave him all authority in heaven and in earth. And that Jesus Christ is the name by which all things were created. You see that? So the, the, the name is powerful because of the one who answers it. He has all power. He has all authority. So his name has that power of the person behind it. That's why the name of Jesus is so powerful. It's about who he is. He is highly exalted. He's highly exalted. 
exalted above the heavens, the Bible says. And, you know, the Bible tells us that the Father gave everything to his son, Jesus. Everything. He gave him everything. That means Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. The Bible says God gave him preeminence. He is before all things. And by him all things consist. That's why his name is so powerful. It's not about how the name sounds. It's about the person that answers the name. Glory to God. Pastor, Pastor, even we just have talking the... about it, there's yes. such a power. Yes, there's know, so much in the name such, of Jesus. Such power. Yes. That's power. And Pastor, we have been given that name. We've been given the power, the yes. legal authority to, to use, use that name. name. To use that name because we are his ambassadors. We act in his name. We're, we're, we're members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Oh. That's an amazing reality. Glory to God. And he gave us the power of attorney to use it. The authority, the legal authority to use that name. Which means that when we use the name of Jesus, it's as though he is the one talking. So we speak for him. We speak in his place when we use his name. So when we say in the name of Jesus, we are saying as representatives of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's why you hear saying words like I command. Oh, yeah, because yeah. you can't you can you can't beg with that name. Oh, it's the biggest name in all the universe. You can't beg with that name. You command with that name. It's the greatest name because it belongs to the one that has all power and authority. That's why we command in his name. When we come out in his name, there's no pleading. Glory to God. There's no pleading. There's no negotiation. Hallelujah. The name is too big to beg with it. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. All right. We'll take a question from Calvin from South Africa. He says, dear pastor, thank you for your wonderful ministry. And it's your blessing to the whole world. Pastor, who are God's first fruits in James 1.18? Who are God's first fruits? Pastor Amici. So thank you very much, sir, for thank you. this opportunity. I just want to read um, the scripture, James 1.18. James 1.18 says, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in context here, Paul, um, James here was talking to believers. So the question who are the first fruits referred to here, the new creation, the Christian, we are a first fruit, the mm -hmm. crowning of God's creation, mm -hmm. the best of, of the first fruit of God's creation. We are the, um, Christ is the first fruit and we are in Christ and we are first fruit of God's creation. So he's talking about creation. us yes, who sir. are born again. Yes, because sir. if you read from the um, 16th verse where he says to them, do not err my beloved brethren. He's talking to the brethren and yes, he says, sir. we are God's first fruit. So he's talking about us. You, if you're born again, you're God's first fruit. So, Calvin, that's what it's about. Okay, um, this is the last one we're going to take. K, mm, K. Anand from Ghana. Why do you think Paul spoke in the present tense in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, instead of past tense, creating the impression that the believer is still a sinner. All right. You want to say something? It's a First Timothy chapter 1. Let's read that scripture, Pastor. Mm -hmm. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Verse 15, sorry. 
this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation mm -hmm. that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom so where he was referring to where he says I am chief you see um, as I think just that scripture that, um, in, on that part the right rendering should actually be of whom I have been a chief not in the present that might be King James it's a King James uh, the, 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 the scripture is wasn't written in English it was in Hebrew and um, is the translation that brought it in the present but I think it should be of whom I have been achieve not that I am a chief. Pastor, can I read yeah. it from the Living Bible? Yes. It says, how true it is and how I long that everyone should know it, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I was the greatest of them all. Yes. Anybody else you want to add something? Okay. Um, my, my thought is this. Um, if we read in context, if we go back a little, Paul narrates how that um, God was gracious and merciful to him, even though he had done so much wrong against um, the gospel. And um, I think Paul was speaking in a language where he could, because we know, based on new creation realities, anyone who is in Christ does not have a past. And yet, because of the limitation of language and to communicate to people, to explain um, certain things you use certain expressions to explain so that they can understand but we know the truth that in Christ there is no there's no past so there's no chief sinner so he's not he's not giving he, there's no misleading um, expression there that um, he's a sinner or the Christian is still a sinner he was only making reference to um, his past but he knows and if you read the whole epistle and the whole teachings of Paul Paul made it clear, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So um, there is a breakaway between that old man mm -hmm. and who he is right now mm -hmm. um, in Christ. There's no mix-up, no really. Mix -up. That's just one, one thing to say. I think the emphasis is on the bit before he said, I'm a chief. Of whom I'm, the, the emphasis is that Christ is a came into the world to save sinners. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the emphasis really is. He picked on present past, but yeah, the emphasis says, really... Yeah, because... The, the man said, of whom I am chief. I'm chief. So he's like, I'm chief of sinners. sinners. The, the, that's the way, that's the way uh, he's looking at it. What's his name? It was in the, past. The, the gentleman who, K, K Anan from, from Ghana. That's the way he's looking at it. Well, um, the, the expression where he says, of whom I am chief. The expression where you have the present I am is a little defective it's a defective verb okay and the reason is this that word is a greek word amy it means i am it means i have been it means i was the same amy can be translated i am i have been i was so it's sometimes not so smart to apply that word because it's what we call a defective verb. And so uh, you would find different translations having a little problem with it. And so some are going to say, I am. And some will say, I have been. And some will say, I was. So whenever you come across a situation like that, where there's a defective verb, what you do is you read the context. And you see whatever else had been said that's consistent with this or did he say anything that contradicts it? See, so you find, just like Pastor Amici was saying, there's nowhere else that he taught such an understanding that um, the new creation should be in this situation of a continual presence of sin or being a sinner or addressing himself as one who is chief of sinners. So that immediately tells you that in that verb where you have I am, I was, I have been, you've got the three of them being applicable to the same term, you pick the one that is consistent with the context. And what is consistent with the context is this. And what Pastor Obi was saying to you was this. 
when you look at the, 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 uh, the key message there, that Christ Jesus came to save sinners, it automatically shows you that if he goes on to say, of whom I am chief, it contradicts the salvation. Which means it is wrong to have it translated, I am. Because he says, he came to save sinners. So if I was one of those that is saved, then I am saved. So I couldn't continue to say, I am chief. See? So that tells you that the other translations are correct. All right? That's simple. Glory to God. Brother Prince from Nigeria. He says, thank you, sir, for this rare opportunity to have you answer my question. Sir, my questions have to do with Pastor Anita's teaching on Tuesday, April the 3rd, 2012. In a Rhapsody devotional titled, Your Heavenly Man, the title got me excited as my custom is with our messenger angel Rhapsody of Realities. But I was a little puzzled when I studied the third paragraph. There, Pastor Anita stated, and I quote, this doesn't mean you're equal with God. Sir, my question is this. If I'm not equal with God, who am I equal with? What is the difference between class and equality? Okay, it's very simple. Uh, what Pastor Anita was telling you there is like this. Imagine you and your dad. You are a human person and your dad your father, your earthly father, is a human person. So you're equal in class, in class of being as humans. So you can relate as humans, but you are not equal to your dad because he is your father and therefore has authority over you in a way that you can never have because he's your father. You are the same class with the president of your country. But he has a certain kind of authority that makes him different from you. So, in that regard, you are not equal, yet you're equal. You're equal as persons, you're equal in class, but you're not equal in authority. So he has a different authority, which is over you. So God the Father gave birth to us as new creations so he brought us to his class of being in that way we are equal with him in nature but not in glory because he is our heavenly father he's greater than we are he's greater even the bible says that jesus christ will submit all things to the father so and he is the son of god so remember that that's that's what that teaching was about that we are not we are um, one with him we are we're in his class of being in that wise equal in his class of being but we are not equal with God because he is greater than we are he's our father he's our father there's a big difference so we pray to him he's our father we are his creatures we are his children you are not equal with your father your dad you see, I'm sure that's getting home to you, right? Given from Zimbabwe, dear Pastor Chris, I would like you to shed more light on the topic of redemption because Paul once wrote that we have been redeemed. Yet, sir, you say we have not been redeemed, but are a product of the redemption. Now, the, the, the trouble with, with this is that... Um, there's so much for me to say for you to actually understand the, the communication that I gave to you regarding the redemption. Now, when you study the Bible, particularly the New Testament, you got several words, uh, redeem, redeemed, redemption, okay? And um, the, or redeeming. Now, the several words in the Greek from where you get all of this, lutron, lutrosis, uh, apolutrosis, um, uh, uh, you have um, agorazo, exagorazo. All of these words are used in different ways to communicate 
redemption in different lives. The point is, when you study the scriptures, you have to understand what is the doctrine of redemption. And then where is the word uh, redemption or redeemed, uh, the several synonyms that I've used, uh, how are they applied? How are they used? For example, when the Bible says redeeming the time, what's it talking about? The redemption of our body, what's it talking about? You see, so these are a play of words. So you have to understand it in depth. The point is, I was dealing with the doctrine of redemption, where we are said to have been bought, um, uh, bought back from sin. That's redemption from sin. And that's what I was dealing with. There's a doctrine about redemption from sin. And I'm talking about how that you have to understand the, the general use of the word redemption as per salvation. And then the redemption as though um, used with the light of the Old Testament where a slave was bought and freed. Now, in that light of the doctrine of redemption, where a slave was bought and set free, that's what I'm talking about. No, we were not bought like that and set free. So that's not the point. You see it? So you have to understand the several usage of the word redeem, redemption, and so on and so forth. And what actually they apply to. You know, English um, is limited in several ways. And you can use one word to express so many different things. So it depends on the thoughts that you're trying to express. And that's what I was dealing with. So you have to understand the Pauline revelation to be able to get exactly what I was talking about. First one is from Mary. Mary is from Namibia. Dear Pastor Chris, what did Jesus mean when he said to the Pharisees in Matthew 12, 7, I will have mercy, not sacrifice. Well, we'll read exactly what Jesus said and then review similar portions of the Bible. Matthew chapter 12 from verse 7. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. Now, when Jesus made that statement, it was clear that he was referring to some other portion of the Bible. He said, if ye had known, if ye had known what this means, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. And it's also very important for you to uh, recognize what was the context they had tried to condemn Jesus for something you know they, they thought he was um, uh, violating the Sabbath day if you would read from verse 1 because of what his disciples did all right now I said he definitely was referring to some other portion of the Bible and I want us to look first at the book of Isaiah Isaiah chapter 1, we'll read from verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, said the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who had required these at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hated. They are a trouble unto me. I am worried to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. And then the famous verse 18 when he says, Come now and let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, and so on and so forth. You remember, it says, it shall be white as snow. Now, 
are the context here is that the people offered sacrifices to God without living right and God was saying to what purpose is your sacrifice while you're not living right and you're mistreating others you're acting wickedly so that's why he said I will have mercy and not sacrifice say have mercy on the oppressed that's exactly what he was talking about I missed other things that he required them to do according to the law now there's another portion of the Bible that's similar and I'll read that to you Hosea chapter 6 and from verse 6 for I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings that's the actual place Jesus was speaking from but I'm showing you the context it says for I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings then it says but they like men have transgressed the covenant there have they dealt treacherously against me Gilead is a city of them that work iniquity and is polluted with blood see it's talking about blood the mistreatment of the innocent that's why he said I will have mercy and not sacrifice I'll read you one more portion and this time Micah chapter 6 from verse 6 where would shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God shall I come before him with burnt offerings with calves of a year old will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil shall I give my firstborn for my transgression the fruit of my body or for the sin of my soul he had shown the old man what is good and what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God you see it so this was the context Queen from Botswana greetings in Jesus name my question is this Jesus said this in Luke's gospel 19 verse 10 for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost and in John 10 10 he also said I've come that they may have life more abundantly what really did Jesus come for of course both of them and that's important remember this if he said he came to seek and to save that which was lost if he saved that which was lost what was the purpose to give them life so he came to save them to give them life so the salvation was for the purpose of them receiving life so that's it so you put the two together and you have a clear gospel message um, BG now I, I, there's another name that you added there I'm not sure how to pronounce it I want to want to pronounce your name wrongly but you're from Germany and the question is first of all I want to tell you that I've been tremendously blessed by your teaching such as increase in grace and success through the Holy Spirit I was reading the article posted on your website titled prayer in the name of Jesus which says that as Christians we don't need an intermediary between us and the Father to pray through Jesus that I said to pray through Jesus to make him an intermediary I would like to understand this teaching in relation to first Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 which says there is one God and one mediator between God and man the man Jesus now that's very simple he says there's one God and one mediator between God and man the man Jesus Christ that's a mediator between God and man not between man uh, between God and, and 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 his children between God and man that's Jesus and so he came as our uh, uh, intercessor not intercessor as our intermediary as our mediator between God and human beings and that's why he brought salvation and now that he has brought salvation we have received Christ we are born of God now we are children in the house we have been reconciled to God in Christ Jesus so now we don't need an intermediary anymore he already did it when we were non-christians when we were in the world 
Okay? So he was our intermediary. He was our mediator before we were born again. Now that we're born again, we don't need a mediator because we're now children of God and we use his name. We live in him. We're in his house. We're in him and he is in us. The world, the non-Christians need a mediator and their mediator is Jesus Christ. And that's what we preach to them. We tell them, Jesus Christ brings you salvation. Jesus Christ reconciles you to God. You see it? So they need to receive that reconciliation. And once they receive it, they become like us who have the ministry of reconciliation. So we are now the mediators, as it were, with Jesus Christ together on one side. You get it? Okay, so that's very important. We have a book titled Praying the Right Way. Praying the Right Way, a book, um, one of our books. So you can ask for it and you get better details because you just read an article on our website. Now you can have even more benefit through that book. Koma Koma from Zambia and says, Pastor, you're my inspiration. What is the difference between holiness and righteousness? Now, what is the difference between holiness and righteousness? Uh, it's very simple. Holiness is a place. Holiness is a condition. And righteousness is a nature. It is a character. So I'll explain briefly. I said holiness is a place and it is a condition. When God sanctifies something, whether it's a place, it's a person, it's a thing, it's called holy because God sanctified it. Now to sanctify means that God has separated it from all others and separated it unto himself. It's a two-way thing. The first part of it is he separates it from everything else, from all others and separates it to himself. It's one thing to separate anything, anybody from other things. But that doesn't mean you have separated that thing to yourself. But in this connection, God separates someone, a person, from others and separates that person to himself. Then you say, that person is holy. When God's presence comes upon someone, or when God's presence comes upon a place like he did on the mountain in the Old Testament, it was called a holy mountain because God's presence came upon that mountain. When God showed up there, it was called holy. Now, the, the, the temple was called holy because the presence of God was there and God had separated that place for himself where he would meet with his people. So, holiness is a place that means a condition, a place in God. When God has separated you to himself, you are called holy. And every child of God is called holy. The Bible says that we are holy. He calls every one of us holy because we are separated unto God. We are sanctified by the Spirit of God to himself. So we're called holy. So that's our condition. We are in a condition of holiness. And we are expected to to perpetually be in a perpetual condition of holiness. That's why it tells us to be holy as God is holy, because um, that means we continually live in him, be where he is, and that's the only way you can always be holy as God is holy, because you're continually living in his presence. So if you are in God's presence, that is the place of holiness. And that is also the sanctifying condition of your life so holiness is a place as um, as well as a condition now righteousness on the other hand is a nature righteousness is that nature of God that uh, describes his rightness his ability to always be right he's never wrong he's always right whatever God does is right just right you see and when God imparts that nature of his, the ability to be right and to do right and to perform right, 
to do righteousness, to do what is good, what is right. When God imparts that nature into your life, you automatically become, you, you are brought into the rightness of God. You become, you, you're part of that rightness, that his ability to be right. You see, that character of rightness is wrought in your spirit. You become one with him. And that means that you can stand in his presence without a sense of condemnation, a sense of inferiority, or even a sense of guilt. See, so God brings you into that uh, uh, life that he has, and your spirit automatically becomes one with that rightness of God. And from then on, you can live out the nature that is in you. So you see, it's your nature now. It's inside you. It's different from holiness. You see, where you're placed somewhere. In, in righteousness, it's in your spirit. It becomes the character of your, of your spirit. It becomes the nature of your spirit. That's what when you're born again, the Bible says you're made the righteousness of God. See, you become one with the righteousness of God. And that's, that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Your character becomes the character of righteousness. And that's why he expects us to live from inside, to live from that character that he has given us. And we start forming it on the outside. For example, when a child is born, that child is characteristically human. You see, he's characteristically human. And so he starts building on that character that he has inside. He doesn't have the characteristics of a dog. He doesn't have the characteristics of a camel. He's got the characteristics of a human. And then he develops that nature through knowledge, through information. And that's what you need as a child of God. So even though you are the righteousness of God, you may find yourself doing all the wrong things because you don't have the knowledge of God. Like a child, if he's not taught how to walk, he may never walk. Not because he doesn't have the ability to walk, but he was never taught. And so he may never walk. And that's why you teach children to walk. When they get of age, you start teaching them how to walk because that's, they start creeping. But if you leave them creeping, they'll always creep. So you've got to teach them. And that's why we teach. And that's why you come to the house of God. Apart from fellowship and all the beautiful things we do in the house of God, you are taught. You are taught how to live the life that you now have. This righteousness that is in your spirit. How can you bring it out? How can you live it out? All right. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. Thank you.
can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. from Kazakhstan and she says hello pastor I wish to know what it really means to blaspheme against the Holy Ghost because sometimes it seems like I've committed that sin and I feel so horrible that God is not going to forgive me I feel like the Holy Spirit has left me what do I do yeah, Pastor. Thank you, sir. Um, can I just uh, read a scripture here from Mark chapter 3, verse 28? That, and that's where um, she took this from. It says, Verily I say unto you, All sin shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies, wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost has never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. So um, what was being addressed here was something they said against the Holy Spirit. And, and that's why this came. And the fact that Emanuela can even be concerned about it means that she's not in the situation yes. of one that has blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Yes. Pastor, can I read the scripture? Yeah. Um, in the book of Hebrews chapter six, verse four, he says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, saying they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. It's not... Um, easy to commit the sin against the Holy Spirit. Like he said, uh, Pastor Obi, uh, to commit that sin, I mean, the fact that you, you, you are convicted of sin means that you haven't sinned against uh, uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit. It's like committing the sin against the Holy Spirit is like apostasy. It is. You, you have to renounce Christ. It's something you will know. It's not something, it's not a mistake. You know you're on this uh, uh, route. You have made up. Without disregard for the yes, Holy sir. Ghost, for heavenly things, for sacred things. Yes, sir. And then you don't, you don't even want to come back. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, Emanuela, you haven't sinned against the Holy Spirit because you still have the love of God in your heart. When somebody sins against the Holy Ghost, he doesn't have the, the love of God in his heart anymore. He doesn't want God. He doesn't even want forgiveness. See, so you are 
still in God's house. All right. Um, there's another one from Tadiz from the United States. Hello, Pastor. What's the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? Okay, I'll just explain that very quickly. Now, they are interchangeably used, especially in the New Testament. But um, if you really want to distinguish between them according to the teachings of the Word, the kingdom of God is the whole realm of God the Father. It's a whole realm, and we're all a part of it. And everywhere that he extends his authority is the kingdom of God. And that kingdom is here in this world and also in heaven. All of heaven is a part of it. And then all of us who are in the earth here and belong to him are a part of it. So that's the totality of God's extension of his authority. Now, the kingdom of heaven, on the other hand, is that kingdom in the earth that Jesus was sent by the Father to establish. So all of that is under Jesus Christ in the earth. He sent him to establish the kingdom of heaven in the earth. So all of us who are born again belong in that kingdom of heaven. Jesus is the head of that kingdom of heaven. The Father is the head of the kingdom of God. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible says that Jesus at the end of all things will submit everything to the Father and all will become subject to the Father. So that's the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And remember, they are interchangeably used. Because in the earth today, the kingdom of heaven is, as it were, the headquarters of the kingdom of God. It's like sometimes you can refer to um, uh, maybe to South Africa as Pretoria because that is where the government seat is. Or you refer to the United States as Washington. And that's because that's where the government sits. Sometimes you refer to a nation with its capital city. And that's the same way that you can interchangeably use the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Incidentally, the real headquarters of that kingdom of heaven is the church. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right, um, there's another one here from Gift. Gift is from Kenya. He says, Pastor, thank you for this opportunity. Here's my question. The book of Genesis chapter 9, verse 3 says, Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. While reading this, sir, the last part of it caught my attention because in my version, NIV, that means the New National Version, and some versions I have checked, the Bible says, just as the green plants, I now give you everything. Does this mean that before Noah, people never ate meat? I ask this because of Genesis chapter 1, verse 29 and 30. Okay, so let's read those portions to you. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 30, the Bible says, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Can you read that in the... NIV. You say everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Mm -hmm. Just as I gave you the green plants, and I give you everything. Okay. All right, go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 29 and verse 30. Verse 29 says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, in thee which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Verse 30. And to every beast of the head, and to every fowl of the hair, and to everything that creepeth upon the head, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Thank you. Now, um, what I want you to first understand here is that man was originally placed in a garden. All right? And in the garden, the Bible tells us that there were plants, beautiful plants, trees, good for food. And as at that time, he didn't tell us that there were uh, squirrels and, and uh, uh, animals of other kinds that were running around the garden 
as part of their food. He just told us about the plants. Now, does that suggest that hidden intent for God's people to eat flesh? No, it doesn't say so at all. But you see, you have to, you have to build any doctrine systematically on God's word. What did he say at each point? And at different points, what did God say? Now, if you study that whole Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 properly, you discover he wasn't trying to suggest being vegetarians. But he started out putting man in a garden. But he never confined the life of man to the garden. And that's what's important. He never confined the life of man to the garden. So, and the... Uh, Noahic life that you were referring to here came during the flood which was many years afterward and before Noah they were already eating meat all the way before then so this is not this scripture doesn't I know that m many vegetarians have used this to give some uh, some doctrine but that's not enough even in the law, you find that God told the children of Israel what to eat and um, what kind of animals to eat. And he said, I gave to you for food. I gave this to you for food. Now, if God said that he did that, when did he do it? Did he change his mind? No. This was his plan from the beginning. And that's exactly what he was telling you in, in that verse. That in the same way that he gave the plants he gave everything that moves when did those things that move come from the beginning they didn't come afterward they were there from the beginning so this was God's purpose from the beginning and that's what this scripture is telling you brother Prince from Nigeria he says, thank you, sir, for this rare opportunity to have you answer my question. Sir, my questions have to do with Pastor Anita's teaching on Tuesday, April the 3rd, 2012. In a Rhapsody devotional titled, You're a Heavenly Man, the title got me excited as my custom is with our messenger angel Rhapsody of Realities. But I was a little puzzled when I studied the third paragraph. There, Pastor Anita stated, and I quote, this doesn't mean you're equal with God. So, my question is this. If I'm not equal with God, who am I equal with? What is the difference between class and equality? Okay, it's very simple. Uh, what Pastor Anita was telling you there is like this. Imagine you and your dad. You are a human person and your dad your father, your earthly father, is a human person. So you're equal in class, in class of being as humans. So you can relate as humans, but you are not equal to your dad because he is your father and therefore has authority over you in a way that you can never have because he's your father. You are the same class with the president of your country. But he has a certain kind of authority that makes him different from you. So, in that regard, you are not equal, yet you're equal. You're equal as persons, you're equal in class, but you're not equal in authority. So he has a different authority, which is over you. So God the Father gave birth to us as new creations so he brought us to his class of being in that way we are equal with him in nature but not in glory because he is our heavenly father he's greater than we are he's greater even the Bible says that Jesus Christ will submit all things to the father so and he is the son of God so remember that that's that's what that teaching was about that we are not we are um, one with him we are 
were in his class of being, in that wise, equal in his class of being, but we are not equal with God because he is greater than we are. He's our father. He's our father. There's a big difference. So we pray to him. He's our father. We are his creatures. We are his children. You are not equal with your father, your dad. You see, I'm sure that's getting home to you, right? Okay, there's another one here, Joy. Uh, Joy is asking, Pastor Chris, Christ Jesus told his disciples to do the will of his Father, which is in heaven. If not, they shall likewise perish. Now, my question is, is it the blood of Jesus that saves man or doing the will of his Father? <laughs> so, Pastor, it's just a, a simple question. Uh, the person is just trying to miss what together. The will of the Father is that Jesus should die for us. Mm -hmm. And when he died, that's the will of the Father. That's right. And just told us that uh, when you see the Son of Man being lifted up, uh, the, then he will draw men to him. He said that. He said, and then the, the Bible let us to know that whosoever believed that Jesus died and was raised from the dead shall be saved. Mm -hmm. the, all those things are the will of the Father. And Jesus Christ told us that he will be raised from the dead mm -hmm. on the third day. Telling us exactly what the Father has in mind. The Father has sent him to come and die for us. So, doing, following Jesus Christ, accepting Jesus Christ, is following the will of the Father. Absolutely. So, they are not the, the, the blood of Jesus Christ is to, uh, that was shed for us for the remission of our sin was actually the Father's instruction and will. Absolutely. So, you are just trying to um, uh, mix two words together. The following, for accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, Believing in the blood of Jesus Christ is actually doing the will of the Father because yeah. he came to die for us. That's it. That's it. Thank you very much. King Success from South Africa. Hello, Pastor. Thank you for the platform to ask questions and receive answers. We're so blessed by this blog. Pastor, the Old Testament folks didn't have the revelation of Christ in them, quote, all right, but God with them, all right. But we, the new creation, have gotten the revelation that Christ is in us. Will it be wrong to say Christ is with me and in me, or to say God is with me? He will never forsake me nor leave me. Um, simple semantics. There's really no problem. If God is in you, he is with you. If Christ is in you, he is with you. But being with someone can mean one of two things. It can mean going together with you, or it can mean agreeing with you. Christ can be in you and disagree with you. That is to say, even though you're a Christian, if you do something wrong, the Lord doesn't approve of something wrong. So he disagrees with you. So he's not with you on that subject, but he is in you. So these are just simple semantics, and um, it's good to put the right things in the right places. So if Christ is in you, he's with you in terms of going together with you. But that doesn't mean that he's with you for everything that you say or do. If you're wrong, he's not with you. How do you know when you're wrong? By the word of God. He gave you his word. Always line up what you do in God's word, okay? Use God's word as your reference for life. All right, um, there's another one from Tadiz from the United States. Hello, Pastor. What's the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? Okay, I'll just explain that very quickly. Now, they are interchangeably used, especially in the New Testament. But um, if you really want to distinguish between them, according to the teachings of the word, the kingdom of God is the whole realm of God the Father. It's a whole realm, and we're all a part of it. And everywhere that he extends his authority is the kingdom of God. And that kingdom is here in this world and also in heaven. All of heaven is a part of it. And then all of us who are in the earth here and belong to him are a part of it. So that's the totality of God's extension of his authority. Now, 
The kingdom of heaven, on the other hand, is that kingdom in the earth that Jesus was sent by the Father to establish. So all of that is under Jesus Christ in the earth. He sent him to establish the kingdom of heaven in the earth. So all of us who are born again belong in that kingdom of heaven. Jesus is the head of that kingdom of heaven. The Father is the head of the kingdom of God. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible says that Jesus at the end of all things will submit everything to the Father and all will become subject to the Father. So that's the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And remember, they are interchangeably used. Because in the earth today, the kingdom of heaven is, as it were, the headquarters of the kingdom of God. It's like sometimes you can refer to um, uh, maybe to South Africa as Pretoria, because that is where the government seat is. Or you refer to the United States as Washington, and that's because that's where the government sits. Sometimes you refer to a nation with its capital city. And that's the same way that you can interchangeably use the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Incidentally, the real headquarters of that kingdom of heaven is the church. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. to me UK thank you pastor for this wonderful opportunity to have to hear the Word of God from you every week so can you please explain what is sin according to the New Testament I heard you say he that works in love cannot sin at the same time and then you said a brother cannot steal from someone to repay another because of love yeah pastor what about the sin the Bible calls sinning against his body in 1st Corinthians 6 18 Please, Pastor, throw more light on what sin is in the New Testament. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, you've actually got two questions there. So I will just run through 1 Corinthians chapter 6 from verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an halot? God forbid did you hear that now then it says what know ye not that he which is joined to one hallowed is one body for two said he shall be one flesh or he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit flee fornication every sin that a man doeth is without the body but he that committed fornication sinned against his own body what know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He says here, if you join yourself with a harlot, it means that you have joined yourself with several others. That's what he's saying. Because a harlot is one who sells her body to others. And so he says, joining yourself to an harlot makes you one with others. So your body becomes part of the... Um, whatever that halot has contracted so he says you sin against your body by doing this so that's the explanation for sin against he didn't say sin against his body like the body the church he's talking about your physical body you your body then secondly what is sin in the New Testament sin in the New Testament is I would advise you to get a tip on the concept of sin. The concept of sin. It helps you to understand all of these details. But first, I might just want to quickly give you a light to this. The parameters for judging sin are two things. Two key things in the Bible. The first one is love. The second one is faith. Now in Romans chapter number 13, Romans chapter 13, reading to you from verse 8. He says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Did you hear that? He that loveth another has fulfilled the law. Then he goes on to say this. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, 
it is briefly comprehended in this saying namely thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself love worketh no ill to his neighbor therefore love is the fulfilling of the law that's what the bible says so anything that is outside love is sin so love is the fulfilling of the law so by walking in love you walk in God secondly if you would go to chapter 14 same well chapter 14 and verse number 23 let me read to you from verse 22 so you get the right context has thou faith have it to thyself before God happy is he that condemneth not himself in that which he alloweth I hear in that so in the New Testament he says it's not whether um, what is this or what is that how do I define this how do I define that he says it's got to do with something here he gives us I'll read it again you have to read the whole chapter for yourself to get the whole picture it says has thou faith have it to thyself before God let it be between you and God happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth and he that doubted is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith for whatsoever is not of faith is sin he's telling you that in faith toward God and faith in the Word of God whatever you do with which you do not condemn yourself like in this case where he was giving um, eating food offered to idols he says if you condemn yourself for it he says then you have sinned he said happy is that one who doesn't condemn himself in that thing which he allows which he does he says the one who doubts is damned he's condemned if he goes ahead he says because he is not doing it out of faith for whatsoever is not of faith is sin so you want to understand what is in the new testament that's exactly it something whatever is outside love or whatever is outside faith or whatever is outside both of them because the bible does say faith works by love all right then um two things are given to us as the causes of sin first one is selfishness and the second one is fear and really when you study the Bible you will discover that selfishness is really the opposite of love and fear is the opposite of faith you see why do people tell lies because they are afraid they are afraid of what might happen if they told the truth that's why why do people steal because they're selfish and they have no faith about God giving, being able to provide for them. They are afraid they may never have. And they're selfish. So selfishness and fear are the causes of sin. And the parameters for judging sin are love and faith. Sammy from UK. Dear Pastor Chris, the Bible says we should confess our faults to one another. Is this related to the confessions done to a priest as practiced by some? Do we really need to confess our daily sins even after Jesus? Well, um, what the Bible is saying there to us about confessing our faults one to another is accepting our faults. When I have wronged you in, or you wronged me, I should be willing and mature enough to say what I've done. I confess my faults. That means I accept my faults, acknowledge my faults. So it's actually an acknowledgement of our faults one to another. Then it goes on to say, and pray one for another that he may be healed. So he's not talking about us going to somebody to say, now I want to tell you all the sins I've committed today. That's not what he's advocating at all. So, and then you talk about um, a confessing, making confessions to a priest, as is done, practiced by some. Well, um, the Lord doesn't tell us to make confessions to a priest, really. But if you did, if you did something wrong and it's on your, it's on your conscience and you don't know what to do, definitely you go to your spiritual um, leader as it were and say 
I've done this. I don't know what to do about it. And that's because you, you, you're still a babe in the Lord and you can then be guided. And um, that minister will pray for you. So that's what it's about. And the Lord did give instruction. He said, Whatsoever, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Which means that that minister can then actually pray for you. And say, in the name of Jesus, your sins are forgiven you. And they'll be forgiven you. You, have to, you must have faith. In This is Bakoma from Cameroon. He says, you were born for such a time as this. Thank you. God bless you, Pastor. Uh, can you please explain the revelation in this scriptures? Mark chapter 13, from verse 15 to 18, especially the scripture in verse 17. Can I read it? All right. Mark 13. Verse 14 to 18. Did you say 14? Yeah. But when... No, from, from verse... Chapter 13, from verse 15 to 18. Okay. But you can start can I just verse read 14. From yeah. 14. Yeah. Yeah. But when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that read it understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains, let him that is on the house top not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house. And let him that is in the field not turn back again to take up his garment. But woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. And pray ye that your flight be not in the winter." I think that um, here is just talking about the the rise of the Antichrist and persecution that will take place um, in the last days. So it's, it's, it's talking about the events of the uh, of the last days, and if he's talking with particular reference to verse uh, seventeen, I think that the issue there is uh, that word war to them that are with. Uh, child. Maybe that's what doesn't really um, understand. But I just, I, it's just a, um, a King James issue. Because in other renderings, it doesn't say war. It's like, ah, alas. Yeah, the, the, the reference is to the Jew, to the children of Israel in the last days. Um, He's not referring to everybody else, okay? And when he talks about the abomination of desolation here, he, he deals with when the Antichrist enters into the temple in the last days and proclaims himself God. Now, these are all eschatological. And uh, it's not something that you're, you're looking for a revelation from because he says the question is, Please, Pastor, can you explain the revelation of this scripture? There isn't any special revelation in it. It's just about the events of the last days, okay, in, a, in an order. And this time, he lets you know the things that will happen in Israel, okay? So that's what it's about. There's no special revelation for, for you to apply to yourself today. Praise God. Now, I'm, I, I have dealt with the events of the last days in their order, okay, beginning with our present day, all the way to when the rapture takes place, the tribulation period, the, 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 the different raptures even during that period, and then the, the coming, the second coming of Christ, the, the battle of Gog and Magog the Bible talks about, the, the, the judgment, the new heaven and the new earth, all of these things we've dealt with in the order of events as the Bible tells us. So don't look for a special revelation here. This doesn't refer to you and is not talking about the rapture of the church either. This is not connected to the rapture of the church. This has to do with Israel. All right.
Stephen from South Africa. Dear Pastor, I want to know about the Sabbath day because the Word of God says we must keep it holy for it's a sign to God and to us. I see a lot of Christians keeping the other nine commandments, but the Sabbath day, they don't keep it. Please tell me about the Sabbath according to the scripture. Thank you. All right, Stephen wants to know about the Sabbath. Pastor, I have a scripture for Stephen. Okay. Ephesians chapter 2, I read from verse 14. For he is our peace, who had made both one, and had broken down the middle wall of partition between us. 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to making himself of twain, one new man, so making peace. Brother Stephen, the law that you're referring to has been abolished. Jesus has done away with the law. Now, we are not to observe the law because it's been abolished. But then, you're probably talking about worshipping God, a day of worship. In the scripture, if you read um, Romans chapter 14, it talks about some people observe one day above the other, while some consider every day alike. And I know that Christians normally worship on Sunday for many reasons. Some uh, probably because the Lord rose on Sunday, resurrected on Sunday. And then some scriptures like um, Acts chapter 20 talks about that. The uh, Christians gathering together to break bread on the first day of the week. And 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 2 talks about when you come together first day of the week. But the truth is that God is to be worshipped every day. It's, there's no one day that should be singled out that... Uh, this is a special day that we worship God. We worship God every day. Yeah. Um, just to add to that, something you need to understand, Stephen, is that the, the, the Ten Commandments that you're referring to were given to Israel over in the Old Testament. God gave them commandments through Moses. And not only the Ten Commandments, He also gave them many other ordinances. And they were to keep all of this to be blessed. And one of those commandments was to keep the Sabbath day holy as a day of rest. God said they should do no work on that Sabbath day. Now, what the Bible tells us is that God actually had the Sabbath day in focus. And that that Sabbath day was not just a regular um, weekly Sabbath. But it was a shadow of what he had in mind. I want to read that to you from the Bible. And um, I'll be reading to you from the book of Hebrews. I'll read um, Hebrews chapter 4 from verse 4. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. He says he has spoken about the seventh day. That seventh day is the Sabbath day that he's talking about. He has spoken about the seventh day in these words. Quote, he says, and on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. That's how it came about. Then he says, again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. It remains, it still remains that some will enter that rest. And those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore God again set a certain day, calling it today. When a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua, now the old, if, you, if you're reading the King James Version, you may find the word Jesus, because um, Joshua is the Hebrew name for Jesus okay so but he's referring to Joshua okay so you have Jesus which was the Greek rendering of the Hebrew Joshua but here he's not talking about our Jesus he's talking about Joshua in the Old Testament who came after Moses so he says if Joshua had given them rest God would not have spoken later about another day you see that there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. 
Now, what he's telling you here is that apart from the, from the weekly Sabbath, when God brought the children of Israel into the promised land, that that was the rest that he was looking at for the children of Israel. So he gave them the seventh day rest as a type of rest from their worries, rest from their troubles, rest from the problems, rest from their struggles. Okay? But that he was looking forward to another day. Now I read again to you from here. He says, if Joshua had given them rest, verse 8, God would not have spoken later about another day. So he says, the seventh day was not the rest that God intended, even though he gave them laws for that, that he was looking at the rest that Joshua was going to take them into. And then even after Joshua took them into that rest, God spoke again about another day of rest, meaning that Joshua's rest was not the final rest. So what was he talking about? He says, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Now the scripture shows us that those who have entered into God's rest, let me read it to you here, from verse 10. He says, For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Alright? So, the rest that he was referring to is the rest in Christ. That's what the Bible says, Jesus is our Sabbath. Jesus is our rest. He said, take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you shall have rest for your souls. So you see, he was not just talking about the rest of the physical body. He was talking about the rest of the soul. And if you come into Christ, you have come into the rest for your soul. Christ is your rest. Christ is your Sabbath. So when you see a lot of Christians not necessarily keeping that seventh day today, it's because they have understood the message that Christ has brought the rest. So when you, when you come into Christ by the new birth, when you're born again, you have entered into the Sabbath. Now you may say, what about worshiping on the, on the seventh day? Like some people say, the seventh day that we should worship. But in Christianity, in Christianity, we worship every day. We are in Christ every day. But there is a special day that God's people would pick and say, we're all coming together. Now, this can happen in different nations and in different ways. The day that is convenient, you can pick it to come together and worship together. That is important. But we started out on Sundays, not because God said they must meet on Sundays, but because in the early church, the apostles began to meet on the first day of the week for two reasons. The first reason was that Jesus Christ arose on the first day of the week. So they called it the Lord's Day. It was the Lord's Day of Resurrection. So the believers began to meet on that day. The second reason they were meeting on the first day was because they could not meet on the Sabbath day because it would conflict with the Jewish Sabbath. And they didn't want to have problems with the Jews because even the Jewish believers were still going to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And uh, the, the Christians, the believers, the, the apostles, they didn't want to have any conflict with the Jewish uh, leaders because many of them had now believed and, but they still maintained their Judaism. So this was how worshiping on Sundays came to be. And if you, if you notice, in many churches, they added Wednesday to it. Some use it, on, some do it on Thursday. Some even have it on Mondays. So we can worship every day, anytime, and anywhere. Praise the Lord. So Sunday is a good day for most of us. In a few countries, like um, in, in the Arab uh, uh, countries, particularly where they have certain very strict rules, uh, Sunday is a day of work. So many of the Christians meet on Fridays or uh, some other day, see, and that's not a problem with them.
you can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. from Burkina Faso. My question is about the number 666 in the book of Revelation. Is it visible or invisible? Many think that it comes from Banks' magnetic cards. Thank you. <laughs> is it visible or invisible? Well, it will be visible to those who, who um, require the information. That means, according to the Bible, it's going to be on the right hand or on the forehead. Of those who receive the mark and the reason for this is for uh, economic regulations and that means for those who require 
to see that map, it will be visible. They would likely use some, uh, some instrument to look at it because it's going to be embedded in someone's forehead or in the right hand. So it will be visible to some extent, at least visible to some instruments. All right, um, Jonathan from Nigeria. Dear Pastor, why is the name of Jesus so powerful? Can an unbeliever use the name of Jesus? Why is the name of Jesus so powerful? What a question. Honestly, I, I, I think it's a good question. Why? Because we talk about use the name of Jesus, pray in the name of Jesus. Why is the name of Jesus so powerful? Pastor, do you want to say something? Because God highly exalted him. God and highly gave exalted him. Gave him a name him. that is above every name. Gave him a name yes, sir. that is above every name. Yes, sir. That means he vested all authority in that name. Yes, sir. Why is the name of Jesus so powerful? What a question. I, I want to have this, Pastor, yes. because um, that's the only name hmm? by which any man can be saved. Yeah. There is no any other name you can call upon to be saved except the name of Jesus. Mm. And um, it's because of the power in that name. Mm. Because he went to the cross and died for us. And like Pastor Obi said, he's been given a name that's mm. above every other name. So for you to be saved, you need that name mm. of Jesus to be saved. I want to tell you why the name of Jesus is so powerful. You see, the name of Jesus... <laughs> It's not the spelling of the name. It's not J-E-S-U-S. -S. The name of Jesus is not how it sounds. It's, it's, it's not the pronunciation. You see? Because even around the world, we don't pronounce the name the same way. The name of Jesus is the name of a person. The reason the name of Jesus is powerful is because it is the name of the person that has the power. You get it? That's why it's so powerful. The man that owns that name was given all authority in heaven and in earth. The Bible says that God gave him all authority in heaven and in earth. And that Jesus Christ is the name by which all things were created. You see that? So the, the, the name is powerful because of the one who answers it. He has all power. He has all authority. So his name has that power of the person behind it. That's why the name of Jesus is so powerful. It's about who he is. He is highly exalted. He's highly exalted. Exalted above the heavens, the Bible says. And, you know, the Bible tells us that the Father gave everything to his son, Jesus. Everything. He gave him everything. That means Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. The Bible says God gave him preeminence. He is before all things. And by him, all things consist. That's why his name is so powerful. It's not about how the name sounds. It's about the person that answers the name. Glory to God. Pastor, and Pastor, we just have talking the... about it, there's yes. such a power. Yes, there's know, so much in the name such, of Jesus. Such power. Yes. That's power. And Pastor, we have been given that name. We've been given the power. Yes. Legal authority to, to use, use that name. name. To use that name because we are his ambassadors. We act in his name. We're, we're, we're members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Oh. That's an amazing reality. Glory to God. And he gave us the power of attorney to use it. The authority, the legal authority to use that name. Which means that when we use the name of Jesus, it's as though he is the one talking. So we speak for him. We speak in his place when we use his name. So when we say in the name of Jesus, we are saying as representatives of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 
That's why you hear saying words like I command. Mm. Because you can't, you, can't, you can't beg with that name. It's the biggest name in all the universe. You can't beg with that name. You command with that name. It's the greatest name because it belongs to the one that has all power and authority. That's why we command in his name. When we come out in his name, there's no pleading. Glory to God. There's no pleading. There's no negotiation. Hallelujah. The name is too big to beg with it. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Milo from Canada. Dear Pastor Chris, I would like to know, sir, what is a call to a Christian? Can we say one is called to be an intercessor? I understand that Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 talks about ministry gifts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So for the call, what is it? And what am I supposed to do if I have that call? Thank you, dear Pastor. Well, he said, what is a call to a Christian? Firstly, it's important for us to understand that there are two kinds of callings that the Bible refers to. The first one is the general calling. And every one of us is called in Christ Jesus. And I want to read that to you from the Bible. I'd like you to turn to the book of Romans chapter 1 and verse 7. Paul is writing here to the Roman Christians, every Christian in the church of Rome. Now Rome at the time. And it says, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, every one of the Christians there was called to be a saint so we are all called to be saints that's the first one we are all called I'll read another one to you in 1st Corinthians verse 2 on to the church of God which is at Corinth on to the church of God which is at Corinth everyone in the church to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord both theirs and ours so we are all called to be saints. Now that's a general calling for all Christians. We are all called of God, called to be saints, called to be his children, born of him. And then in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, But the God of all grace, who had called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, you see that? He has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that he has suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthening, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So those scriptures help us to understand that we are all called to God's glory, called to be saints. But then the second kind of calling is for individual ministers individuals in the Lord and an example is given to us from the Old Testament into the new from verse 9 into verse 10 and being made perfect he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek and then verse 4, And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So Aaron in the Old Testament was called of God, and then Jesus Christ called of God. See? So the calling here has to do with individuals. And then you come also to Paul's declaration and reference to himself. In Romans chapter 1, 
and you'll find it in several of his epistles how he opens it. From verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. He didn't say called to be a saint now, because we're all called to be saints. So he says, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading from verse 1, he says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, and sustain his our brother. He didn't say sustain his called also he. But he says he Paul was called to be an apostle and he was with sustain his our brother. He didn't say our apostle. So you notice there that there are different kinds of callings the general calling and then the specific calling. Now you have a question can one say that is called to be an intercessor well the intercessory ministry is for every believer every Christian is called to be an intercessor because the intercessory ministry is in our office as priests we are priests of God and we're all called to intercede for other people now there will be certain Christians who take that more seriously than others not necessarily because there is an office of an intercessor because we all have that office we're all called into that office and it's the office of priesthood so every Christian should be an intercessor but like in everything it's just like evangelism we're all called to be soul winners but some are going to take that responsibility more seriously than others it's the same way so we can say some people are called into soul winning. We are all soul winners. Now, that's different from the ministry of an evangelist. An evangelist is a preacher. A soul winner may not be a preacher, but he wins souls. It's got nothing to do with preaching, announcing. You talk to someone, you may not preach. You might teach. You might explain. Explain the gospel, live by example and lead people to Christ reconcile others to Christ and that is the ministry of every Christian but some will do it more seriously than others the same thing with intercession so um, because of that there are those who say that they are called into the office of an intercessor but there's no such thing in the Bible it belongs to every one of us every one of us has that responsibility to intercede Now, the other part of your question is uh, what am I supposed to do if I have that call? You answer it. If God calls you, you'd know, you'd hear it, you'd hear it in your spirit. You answer it and do what He's called you to do. Uh, he pulled us from Germany. Dear Pastor Chris, are there any differences in one, to see the kingdom of God, two, to enter the kingdom of God, three, to inherit the kingdom of God? If there are, what qualifies one for which? <laughs> to see, to enter, and to inherit. And you know evangelists <laughs> are powerful. They can teach on this. They can preach and, and, and you know, talk about uh, to see it, to enter and to inherit and uh, how these three are different and you can see it afar off and then you can enter it and fall out of it and then uh, finally inherit it and possess it well um, it's important for you to understand that where it says to see the kingdom of God the word see in the Greek really is um, it's a word for a certain kind of knowledge. See, idol. It's, it means to be aware. That's really what he's talking about. It's, it's an awareness. You become aware of it. Except the man is born again. He cannot be aware of the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying. He, he can't perceive it. He can't, he can't so he, because of that, 
in the fifth verse, chapter 3, St. John, he says, the man cannot enter except he's born of the Spirit. So he's dealing with the same thing. To be aware of it, he says, except the man is born again, he cannot be aware of the kingdom. So you have to be born again to be aware of the kingdom. But once you're born again, you're in the kingdom. See, so he's dealing with an awareness of, of this reality. And then he says, except you're born of the Spirit, you cannot enter. But when you're born of the Spirit, you have entered. See, so don't get confused about the use of these uh, uh, terms, see, enter, inherit. The truth is, when you're born again, you have become aware of the kingdom. You, otherwise, you're not a part of it. And when you're born again, you have entered the kingdom because you're born into the kingdom. And when you're born into the kingdom of God, you become an heir of the kingdom, which means you've inherited it. And the word that's translated there, inherit, really means to possess it, to have it. And it also means to enter into it. So he's dealing with the same things. So you don't need any three, three point message on see, enter and inherit. Okay, they're all the same. Joan from Canada. Can anyone serve the Holy Communion to other people? And where is it written in the Bible about who can administer the Holy Communion? Uh, that's very nice. Thank you. Now, um, if you study the Word, the Bible tells us how they broke bread from house to house. It um, tells us about the breaking of bread and te tells us about the, the communion, um, the, the cup. It says the, the, the cup which we drink, the bread which we break. Now, all of this, he relates to the communion. The cup, he says, the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread, he says, the communion of the body of Christ. Now, this is very important. Understand that when the communion started, the church was a baby church. Most of the information that you have about them breaking bread from house to house and all of that is from the church, when the church was still a baby church. Okay, the church of Jesus Christ was just starting. And they did a whole lot of things. But um, what you would find, every group has a leader. A group without a leader is questionable. It means there's confusion. And God is not the author of confusion. In every group, there's a leader. Even if it's a little cell of three members, one will speak for the group. So there's a group, there's a leader for every group. So... When you have to break bread at your group level, whatever size of the group, whether the group has a size of 10,000 10, people or 10 people, someone must be the leader of the group. Now, the one who's the leader of the group will administer it. Now, you've got to understand, in the churches, the pastor is the leader of the group. Now, the pastor can give instructions and allow for communion, uh, communion meetings to be organized at smaller group levels. Now, the instruction would be that the leader of that group, of the smaller groups, recognized by the pastor, will be the ones to perform the administration of the communion. So follow whatever the instruction that is given at the various ministry levels. Let me read something to you from the Bible that will be helpful to you. We know that Jesus, when he broke bread with his disciples, he was the one that administered it. We know that the apostles did. They, they administered that in the churches. Now we do know that they had these meetings from house to house. And it isn't clear to us who was running these meetings from house to house when you study the book of Acts in the earlier chapters. But when you study the latter chapters where Paul had these uh, meetings, these fellowships in different houses, in his epistles, he mentioned the names of those who ran the fellowships. 
So they were not just meetings where anybody controlled whenever anybody came. He mentioned the names of those who ran the meetings. Because by the time Paul was writing, he already had set in order many things. Now let me read to you from uh, 1 Corinthians. From the 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And um, from verse 26, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily in an unworthy manner, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That means many die. And if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Did you notice? He will set in order when he comes. Already he's given us an order for the communion. And notice if you study this portion properly, you, dis you discover that he distinguished between the love feasts and the communion. They used to have love feasts. Now if you study the whole chapter, you get this picture. They used to have love feasts where everybody brought food to the church. You know, they all contributed. Everyone came, came to church with food. And they, they shared their food and they ate. But as time went on, some of them came with their food and, and they didn't wait for others. And they started eating because they brought the food anyway. And so and Paul said to them, what you're doing is wrong. When you come to the house of God with your food, he says, this is not the communion. He says, this is not the communion. He says, everyone eats as he likes. No one waits for the other. Some are full, drunken, and some are, 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 are hungry. Then he says, is it right for you? He says, do you, do you want to shame those who don't have? Because some, couldn't, some, some didn't have anything when they came to church. They didn't have food. Others had in abundance. He says, you want to shame those who don't have? Then he said, now here's my instruction to you. If you are hungry, eat at home before you come. Can you see that? So, you know, for, he says, in the breaking of bread in the house of God, it's not about who's hungry. Don't come to eat here for your hunger. He says, eat at home before coming. Because when you come, it's about fellowship. It's a spiritual thing. So you can study all of that for yourself and um, you, would, you would learn quite a bit. But then he says, the rest will I set in order when I come. So this helps us to understand that there are things that we are expected to do um, in the house of God. And there are orders. And as, as um, ministry develops, the set in order different things as may be necessary. They said in order different things as may be necessary. And that's what happens in various ministries. Praise God. Robbie Lamb from USA. Dear Pastor Chris, in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27, it says, It is appointed unto man once to die, after death, judgment. Please explain when and where the judgment will take place. God bless you. Firstly, it's important for us to um, read accurately what the Bible really says in that portion. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. I'd like to read it to you properly because I noticed that all over the world because it's misquoted they get the wrong interpretation the Bible does not say it is appointed unto man wants to die it doesn't say so it reads thus and as it is appointed unto man wants to die but after this, the judgment. And the, 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 the sentence is not over. 
until you go into verse 28. It does not say it is appointed. It says as it is appointed. And it starts with the word and. And the, the, the Greek word there could also be rendered now. It says, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. And it says, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him. A fungi from Cameroon. Dear Pastor, my question is, will the Holy Spirit still be in the earth after the rapture and during the time of the great tribulation? Thank you, sir. Yes, the Holy Spirit will still be in the earth because, you know, during the great tribulation, there are many others who will give their hearts to the Lord during the tribulation. And that will not be possible without the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit will still be in the earth. He will not be taken away. He will not leave the earth. He will be here during that period. Sunday from Nigeria. Is it true that Jesus wasn't sent to die for the whole world? Because in Matthew 15, 24, he said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yes, I know that um, some people only quote that part because that's what they know. Um, let me just put it again. So if you didn't, if you didn't get it, so you understand what, um, what this gentleman from Nigeria is asking. You know, Jesus said, I was not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And even when he sent out his disciples, he said, don't go anywhere. Don't go into the, so the land of the Samaritans. Just go to the Israelites because I was not sent, but to the house, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But you see, that's to isolate the word of God in a certain uh, position. You have to realize that Jesus did say several other things in connection with his ministry. Now, at this time, what Jesus was talking about, the Lordship of the house of Israel, he was carrying out his ministry under the law of Moses. He functioned under the law of Moses. He had to fulfill the law of Moses. Jesus came to fulfill the law of Moses. He fulfilled it and then abolished it. But he had to fulfill it first. He fulfilled it for Israel because the law of Moses was given to Israel. And they broke his law. They broke God's law. They never obeyed him. They disobeyed God. And so they got into trouble. And so God sent Jesus. And when Jesus came, he had to fulfill the law on behalf of Israel. So while he was carrying out that ministry on behalf of Israel, he said, I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he had to do that and fulfill it. After he fulfilled it, he abolished it. After he abolished the law by his death, what he said came to be. That he was the lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Now, here's something interesting. In the, in the 16th chapter of St. Mark's Gospel, and in the 28th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus said, the gospel should be preached to all nations, to the whole world, to every creature. That means everybody now, not just Israel. Because he fulfilled it for Israel, because only Israel was given the law, he fulfilled it, abolished it, and made it possible for everybody else to come to God. Now he tells us, preach the gospel to everybody. Grace from Zambia is asking, is the Muslim God the same as those of Christians? No. There's a reason why I say no. I'm not sure. I think I'm not sure they they are thinking the same thing that I'm thinking. In other words, a Muslim may not may not think that I'm that I'm right to say that is not the same God. But I can say they're not. Um, 
The reason I say they're not the same God is this. The God that the Christians worship sent Jesus and Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. He said, no man comes to the Father, that means to God, except through me. So, if there's any religion in the world that people um, try to go to God without going through Jesus, then of course, that must be another God. See, that must be another God because the God of the Christians is the God of Jesus Christ and is a God who raised Jesus from the dead because the Christians believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and that Jesus is not dead. He died, but God raised him up and showed him openly the other people who saw him alive. And, 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 and when he went to heaven, he didn't vanish. According to the Bible, he just ascended from the ground and they saw him lifted. You see, and he went into the clouds as they watched him. This his disciples saw. And another beautiful thing about him is the fact that his name has power. When you pray in the name of Jesus, the Father answers. And that's why Christians believe so much in miracles and these miracles without necessarily having to do something about it. They don't have to work out something uh, 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 except working a miracle in the name of Jesus. See, they don't mix uh, concoctions. They don't rob things for, uh, um, for some divine power to take place. They don't drink something for it to happen. They don't have to eat something for it to happen. They call the name of Jesus. They pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, and the Father responds. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So, um, they're not the same God. They're not the same God. The God of the Christians um, only answers through Jesus Christ. And um, he has said that Jesus is his son. And, and then the Bible says there is no other name. In Acts chapter 4 verse 12, there is no other name under heaven on the heaven given amongst men by which we shall be saved. No one gets saved except the name of Jesus. See, so um, that's it. Julius from Nigeria is asking, were Adam and Eve the first people on earth? Yes, the first human beings. Honor the first human beings. They were the first people. They were the first that God created in his image on earth. So that's what the Bible says. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The first man. He calls him the first man and he says Adam. So that's the first Adam. Crispin. And Crispin is from Zambia. I want to know more about the tree of life. Was it a particular tree or an instruction for an ordinary tree? In Proverbs, there are a few more definitions. Pastor, what is the tree of life? Well, the tree of life was a real tree in the Garden of Eden, according to the Bible. Like you had the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There were other trees, and the tree of life was one of them. In fact, after the Lord drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, he sent an angel to take care of that tree of life to make sure nobody went there but in the book of proverbs and in several other places the tree of life is used as a metaphor for what the real tree of life was supposed to do then again in the book of revelation is referred to and in that place it's an actual tree of life so uh, it was a real tree when it was uh, in the garden of eden back in the book of genesis
you can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now.